All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my talk on the rise of Loom and the evolution of reactive programming. So I'm John DeGoes, I'm CEO of Zyverge, and I'm here today because uh, Evolution Gaming asked me to speak. So I'll have a few words about Evolution Gaming at the end, please stick around for that. And I'm very excited to be here today and talking to you all about what I believe to be the most significant innovation in the JVM in the past decade, for sure. So that's a big statement, but I aim to back it up in this talk today. I hope I have you convinced by the end of this talk that Loom is big news for JVM developers everywhere. And obviously that includes Java developers. I know we have a, a Java audience tonight as well, but also closer to my home base, Scala de developers as well. Scala is uh, first and foremost, a JVM programming language. And to see the JVM get such a monumentous increase in its capabilities for building modern day applications is really exciting. And between that and Scala 3, it's a good time to be a, a Scala developer for sure. So I also happen to be co-organizing Functional Scala 2020. And what, what I thought we would do tonight is give away a free ticket to whoever has the best question at the end. So stick around and try to make a note of any questions you have. You can ask them on Zoom, either now using the Q&A feature. I won't see them until the end. I'm not gonna take questions until the end, but I, I will see them, I'll get around to them. And then we're gonna give one ticket to whoever has the best question. Best, I don't know how we exactly decide that. <laughs> Maybe most interesting, most funny, or leads to uh, most interesting answer. I don't know, we'll, we'll figure that out. But anyway, stick around to the very end if, if you want a shot at attending this great conference that also has a Scala 3 workshop included and 25 great talks and as well as some other content around it. So today we are going to be talking about threads. First off about the challenges of threads. Why do we have threads and why are they a problem? And then I'm gonna be introducing, of course, the highlight of my talk is Project Loom, which is a re relatively new project designed to add some new critical functionality to the JVM that's going to change the way we do a lot of reactive programming. And then finally, I'm gonna end up with a short section on Beyond Loom. So I, I wanna take the time to talk about the problems that Loom solves, but also the problems it doesn't solve and what space is there for other libraries and frameworks like many of the ones that we see right now in the reactive ecosystem to come in and build great functionality on top of Loom that makes it easier to access some of this functionality. So section number one, dangling by a thread. What does every business want? Well, they want low latency, they want massive throughput and they want resiliency especially in this day and age when so many dollars are flowing on the electrons that connect our, our houses and our businesses to one another, there's money, there's real money involved in every single request that comes in. And so we wanna process these incoming requests and the incoming flows of information from smartphones and sensors and all that with super low latency and very high throughput. And we wanna do so in a resilient way. So if there are problems, transient failures, we're able to isolate those, sandbox them, and respond to them in a very sort of resilient way. Now, historically, if we want lower latency and we wanted higher throughput, we just go to Intel and we say, make your processors faster, Intel, so you can run our increasingly slow software. Um, it's a little bit on us that, you know, the way we have of writing software in some cases today involves writing C++ that's transpiled to assembly, an assembly subset of JavaScript that runs in a browser that runs on an operating system, which is running in a container on an operating system that's been virtualized in the cloud. That's on us. But nonetheless, Intel complied. For many, many years, they would come out with these chips that were twice as fast as predecessor generations. But then something happened in right around 2015. Uh, Intel came to us and said, no, no can do. Sorry, folks, you're out of luck. Uh, we either have to listen to you or the laws of physics. And Intel chose the laws of physics. Now, that said, they didn't stop evolving entirely. Rather, Moore's law shifted. So back in the old days, Moore's law said every 18 months, 
Intel would double the speed of your CPUs. Well, that stopped being true, but nonetheless, roughly every 18 months, Intel is still doubling the number of transistors inside your CPU. And what are they using all these transistors for? Well, among other things, they're using them to add the ability to execute more things in parallel. So they do that in three primary ways. First off, you have simultaneous multi-threading, and that's when uh, a single core in your CPU can actually execute instruction sets from more than one thread simultaneously. Intel calls this hyper-threading, but the more generic name for that is simultaneous multi-threading. Then you have cores. So every CPU actually contains a bunch of cores on it. And then you have on top of that, if that's not enough, you can actually take and stick multiple CPUs inside the same system. That's called symmetric multiprocessing. And as a result, the number of things that a modern CPU can do in parallel has skyrocketed. In fact, I'm, I'm doing this presentation using Zoom on a machine that's capable of doing 32 things at the same time. And that's a desktop computer. It's not even server a server computer. It's just an ordinary desktop computer that can do 32 things at the same time. So that's amazing. But um, just because today's processors have the ability to do a lot of things at the same time by supporting multiple threads running simultaneously, that doesn't always mean that the solution to improving latency and throughput and scalability and performance and resiliency is using more and more threads. In fact, that's, that's kind of a myth. You know, many, I've seen many questions on Stack Overflow where they're like, okay, I upped the number of threads to 200 threads now and it's not going any faster. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's because um, threads don't make your problem faster. Actually, ultimately the bottleneck in your system is, is not threads, it is cores. It is the ability to do N things at the same time. And so whether that's four or whether that's 32 or 128, fundamentally your hardware has some limitation there. And, and you can't get any faster than that. So it makes sense in an ideal world for you to have a number of threads equal to the number of cores on your machine. And if you go out and do benchmarks, you're gonna find no matter the problem domain, uh, assuming that you have work that is CPU bound, so CPU and async work, then the optimum number of threads for any given problem is going to be equal to the number of cores inside that machine, give or take, you know, plus or minus. And if you add more and more threads um, to your application, you're only gonna slow things down and you're gonna get slower and slower and slower and slower until ultimately you don't make any progress. You just spend too much time. What, what your operating system ends up doing is it spends so much time switching between the different threads and not enough time actually doing useful work. So why is this a problem? Well, it's actually a problem for historical reasons. So way back when Java was invented, the designers of Java made the decision to expose threads in the following fashion. Every thread inside the JVM actually maps one-to-one -to, -one to a thread in the operating system. Now, in hindsight, that was one of the biggest mistakes possibly ever made on the JVM platform. And the reason for that being a mistake is that other programming languages, for example, Haskell, choose a green threading model where the user can create, and Erlang and many others have this green threading model where the user can create as many threads as they want, and they don't map one-to-one -one on operating system threads, rather a bunch of threads in that programming language end up mapping to a single operating system thread. Now, we don't have the luxury of, of having made that decision. So we, we use threads. And so early frameworks and applications, they started using threads or threads. And then when web servers became popular to do in Java, you know, Apache and all the web server stuff that went on early on in the early days of Java, they used lots of threads and they hit something called the, the C10K a scaling problem, whereby basically you can't create more than 10,000 concurrent threads at a time without so much overhead being um, being su sucked up by the overhead of context switching and by the amount of memory consumed by 10,000 threads and so on. So what did we do? Well, we programmers are very good at creating hacky workarounds for problems that are you know, themselves hacks. We're very, very good. We have decades of experience of doing this. So what do we do? Well, we invent this little thing called a callback. And callbacks, they, they don't seem like a, a terrible idea at first. The basic idea is, you call an API and instead of it 
um, doing going about its business and producing a value synchronously and returning that value. Rather, what it does is it accepts uh, callback parameters, one or more callback parameters. And that way, the call API method, it, it doesn't have to waste a thread um, sitting around waiting for the result to be computed. Instead, it can go off and do that work in the background, whether it's IO or sleeping or whatever it is, it can do it in the background. And then when that result has been computed, or when enough information has been read from a socket or a file or whatever, then it can call your callback with the result. So callbacks are really a type of promise saying, hey, call me later. You know, don't, don't call me now, call me later when you have some result. And if you look at an API like this, you might think, well, what's the big deal? It doesn't look that much harder to use, right? We just call call API and we give it an on success consumer and an on failure consumer and done, you know, we're, we're good to go. The problem is this just doesn't scale. In fact, it leads to something called callback hell, which is you call a callback and then in your success callback, you have to call something else that has a callback. And then there you have to call another thing and it leads to this nested horrible, horrendous style of programming that is monstrous to look at. And so what do we programmers do? Well, we invent stuff. We invent more hacks around the hack that's built on a hack and in our case, we invented future and completion stage and completable future and Rx Java, you know, reactive extensions for Java and actors and Quasar and this and that, a billion other different solutions, all designed to work around the problem that, hey, locking threads is really, really expensive and callbacks are a much more efficient use of your finite hardware resources. Now, what are the implications of that? Well, take code like this. So this code, this was the old style of code that we wrote back in the day when we didn't have to worry about multi-threading, when we just had single-threaded applications and we could afford to write everything in a synchronous style. We could afford to block threads. You know, we had, if we were lucky, we had 10 concurrent requests running on one server. That was the old days, but now the whole world revolves around the internet. You don't have 10 concurrent requests. We have 100,000 or we have a million or who knows how many we have. We have a lot of concurrent requests. We have to handle all of them. We have to handle all of them efficiently. But back in the day, this is how we wrote code. And code like this, you can look at it and you can understand it. We call new payments. We, we pass the perform payment thing to payment handle. Then we try to authorize the payment. And then um, if it's authorized, we complete it with success. Otherwise we complete it with failure, right? There's, there's nothing fancy about this code. You look at it and you're like, okay, yeah, I know exactly what it's doing. Well, what's the problem with this code? Aside from the fact that it doesn't scale, it sucks up threads, it hits the C10K boundary and so forth. Well, it's, it's dull, it's boring, it's not exciting, it's not, it's not shiny and reactive. So fast forward to today, we don't write that old code anymore, it's too boring. We write this code, yes, completion stage. This one returns the completion stage of an either of command failure or a tuple two of payment ID or payment status. Wow, and how does it do that? Well. Good luck figuring that out. I think we almost have Stockholm syndrome this day and age because we look at code like this and we're like, oh yeah, I know what's going on here. Of course, you know, we're, we're programming using continuation passing style or, or whatever it is. But honestly, if you take a step back and say, does this code cleanly, clearly reflect business intention? You have to say no. This code is not as simple or as easy to understand. It tangles some irrelevant implementation details into our business logic, it makes it harder to understand. So Stockholm syndrome aside, we should all be able to look at this and say, somewhere along the path to get where we went to, where we are today, we, we made a misstep. And maybe that misstep, it was made in the JVM, so we didn't have a choice. This is what we have to do. Honestly, it sort of is what we have to do, but there has to be a better solution. And if this weren't enough, so this is, this is honestly, it's enough to convince a lot of people that hey, maybe we should reconsider using Java at this point. Maybe we should switch to something else. But if this weren't enough to, to persuade you to look elsewhere uh, to build modern cloud native applications, then you have to look at the implications that this style of programming has on the rest of the language. So take an ordinary while loop, a while loop or a for loop or a do while loop or even an if statement. All of this machinery, it breaks down. You can no longer use it, sorry. It just doesn't work. You stick, you stick call API in a while loop, it's not gonna do what you think it is. And 
Um, and you're going to have a massive amount of pain if you if you try to collect together all the results from all these different success callbacks and error callbacks. It is a massive pain that you don't want to try to solve. And, and that means it instantly cuts off from you a huge number of language features that you know about. You've already mastered while loops and do while loops and for loops and if statements. You know how to use all those. You can't use them anymore. They're gone. Bye-bye. And not just control flow constructs, but also resource safety. So every language, or at least almost every language, it has a construct like try finally baked into it. And this construct is designed to help you not leak any resources because you can allocate the resource and then you can use it in your try block and you can free it in your finally block. And that way, if anything goes wrong in the, in the try block, the finally block will still be executed and the resources will be safely released. Well, what happens in the async world? Eh, it doesn't work anymore. You, you can't just stick your code in the try block and expect anything meaningful to happen. Say goodbye to try and finally and all the other code that's based on them that tries to give you resource safety. It just doesn't work anymore. And along with that, you may as well say goodbye to stack traces because stack traces go away in an async world. Every time something, one of your completion stages or whatever it is fails, you don't get any meaningful information out. Good luck trying to diagnose a problem when all you see is the guts of whatever sort of reactive library you're using or abstraction or data type you're using. Now, to be fair, there are libraries out there that go out of their way to try to provide you with meaningful stack traces, but they are by far the exception. They're not the norm. And ordinary programming in Java, like just using these ordinary data types, you can throw all that stuff out the window. So that's, that's sad. It's sad that we had to give up all of this. But what's funny, well, well that gopher there, he thinks something's pretty damn funny because he's, he's laughing. What's he laughing at? Well, because languages like Go, modern programming languages like Go, they don't have this problem. Honestly, they don't have this problem. Because every time you call Go on some procedure, the Go programming language, it doesn't start a native operating system thread. No, it starts a lightweight, a green thread that is called a Go routine. And that doesn't consume resources. It doesn't consume operating system level thread resources. So you can have hundreds of these things, thousands, even millions of them, and everything's just humming along fine. So you don't have to program to the limitations, kernel level limitations. The limitations in the kernel exist for a good reason, because even though threads have overhead, we need to share the resources among all the processes that we have. But honestly, there's no excuse for such waste at the level of a process. A process should be very efficient, and a process should not create unbounded number of threads. And languages like Go that are modern, they take this consideration to heart, and they try to provide good programmer experiences that, re that don't require that you program in a weird way and give up lots of language features in order to benefit from, um, from concurrency. So what does this tell us? It, it tells us that Java has, has done enormous good for the world. It's had a tremendous impact on the world of server-side application development. There's no question. Like if I think of a single uh, server-side technology that, that's just shaped the, the landscape of back-end development, I can't think of one that has had more impact than Java. But at the same time, Java has made some mistakes early on. And some of these mistakes, they are costing us to this day. Like think about startup times of JVM. That's another thing that's costing us quite severely. And, and Graal VM is hopefully going to change that. But beyond that, you know, this, this issue of Java not having green threads, of, of these heavyweight threads that sort of destroy our ability to use the language and impose such massive taxes on us that you don't have another language, it, it's certainly part of the reason, in my opinion, why Java is less relevant today than it was, say, 10 years ago. So even though Java is not as, as hot as it once was, it's still a very impressive force, you know, tons of jobs. I have lots of good things to say about Java, but its relevance, it's, it's not the same as it once was. It's not the hottest technology out there. And there are other lots of viable choices, especially in this age of containerization. So the JVM provided a standardized environment in which you could deploy lots of applications. That's no longer a benefit in an age of containerization. So if you combine that with high startup times um, caused by JVM just being so monumentously slow to start up, combined with the lack of green threads and the, the forced reliance on all these reactive frameworks, we're, we're looking at, at uh, sort of a slow decline being almost an inevitable thing. So that brings me to Weave of a Loom. 
So who is going to save us from this decline? Who is going to reverse this decline or at least you know, make it slower? <laughs> who knows? Who knows what's going to happen in the future of Java development? But I can tell you one thing, I am extraordinarily excited about Project Loom. Project Loom does not bring anything new compared to a new programming language, okay? But it does go back way in time and try to fix one of the earliest mistakes ever made in the JVM, one that is continuing to cause us significant pain. And if you add that, rectifying that mistake, combined with all the other innovation we're seeing out of, out of Oracle these days, Java is really pushing ahead, you know, with GraalVM and uh, Project Valhalla and all the great stuff that's coming out. Wow, we are being blown away by the innovation that's, that's seen on the JVM. If you add that combined with all the legacy code bases out there in Java, all the wonderful libraries, we have a killer ecosystem with a library for every single thing. And Project Loom comes along and says, hey, we are going to rethink how we do threading. And all that legacy cruft, maybe there's a way where we could give you the benefits of green threads without breaking all the stuff out there. That's what Project Loom is all about. It's about rectifying that ancient mistake and making the JVM more relevant than ever before. How does it do that? Well, it does it by adding a new subclass of the thread type. So we all know about Java Lang thread, at least if you've done some level of concurrent programming, you've probably run into that whether or not you wanted to. And Java Lang thread is the operating system level thread. Well, now also it has another subclass. And that subclass is actually not an operating system level thread. It's something called a virtual thread. And a virtual thread is non-blocking. It's designed to be a green thread. And so you can have many actual virtual or many virtual threads run on a single JVM thread, which maps to a single operating system thread. Net result is suddenly you can have hundreds of thousands, who knows, gigantic numbers of virtual threads all running on a small number of actual physical threads. That's, you know, even though that you, you tell that to a Go programmer and they'll be like, oh, you get over yourself now. But, but for us on the JVM, wow, that is a big deal. That is monumentous. That is game-changing technology there that has the potential to revolutionize the way we do software development in the Java ecosystem. How does this magic happen? It happens because there's a new construct. This is currently actually exposed in the Loom preview. So you can take a peek at this and play around with it if you like. It won't be exposed when this um, goes live. But what it is, is it's a data type that encapsulates the idea of a continuation. It's a very simple type of continuation, but you can build other things on top. And for us functional programmers in the audience, you're going to recognize what a continuation is. It's the argument that you pass to flat map. That's what a continuation is. So yes, the answer to solving concurrency problems on the JVM actually turns out to be monadic. Hey, not, not bad, right? Anyway, this continuation data structure, how it works is you create a continuation and then you pass it a runnable. And inside that runnable, somewhere inside that runnable, you decide to yield. And when you yield, this is actually a special operation and intrinsic that's been implemented in the JVM. What it does is it actually copies the stack up to that point and copies it in the heap and then immediately ret returns control to the, the outer continuation. The continuation is now suspended. And then you have to call a run on the outer continuation if you wanted to resume at that point. And when you resume at that point, it copies the previous, basically preloads the stack of that thread that's running it, um, all with this information that was saved to the heap and then continues execution at that point. So it's basically a way to go down deep into a method, save your spot by calling yield, and then later on, someone else can resume it by calling run and it restores it and then continues on. So this is really, I, I have to admire the fact that this, this definition of a continuation is almost the simplest possible thing that could work. Because on top of this, you can build support for the more typed variations of continuations that we know of and love in functional programming. So you can build all of that on top of this one. So this is just very idiomatic Java, low level, not type safe at all. There's no types in it at all, but nonetheless, it's, it's the simplest possible thing that you could use to implement all of those different things. And it fits really well into the rest of the Java ecosystem. So this continuation thing, it is fantastic because it allows the JVM to offer this new way of starting a thread, of a virtual thread. 
It's very simple. You just call thread.start virtual thread and you feed it a runnable. And that is implemented using that continuation mechanism. So what does that mean? Well, for one, it means why stop yourself at one virtual thread? Why not fire up a thousand or even a million? These virtual threads, they scale way past the limitations of physical threads. So way beyond those limitations. Basically, the only limitation is the memory in your machine. You're not limited. You're not constrained anymore by resources of operating system level threads. You can create as many virtual threads as your operation requires. They're super cheap, super lightweight. You can have as many of these things. You can spin them off for one-offs. You know, if you want to do something in the background, do it on a virtual thread. You know, really, it doesn't matter. You can use these things with reckless abandon, just like you can use fibers in modern day functional effects systems like Zio. It's the same idea here. Try this if you're brave. Try this little snippet of code, but use real threads and see what happens to your machine. You probably will not survive the enga engagement. Not only that, but inside these virtual threads, you can do blocking operations. For example, you can do thread sleep. Or you can do lots of other things. You can do some network IO. You can do all these things. And guess what? They don't block. No more blocking anymore. So that ordinary synchronous code right now that you've been told never, ever write, how many times have you been told, you know, don't, don't write thread sleep. You do it using an asynchronous scheduler. Or how many times have you been told, don't use Java's, you know, HTTP URL connection. It's a blocking client. Don't use that. Well, now you can use that. You can use all of that stuff. All the NIO stuff, non-blocking. All of the locks in Java Util concurrent, non-blocking, all of that stuff instantly, magically, well, not so magically. I know Alan and, and Ron and other people work very hard on bringing this technology to life, but now it magically works 100% async. So all that blocking code no longer blocks. That means that finally we can go back to that dull, boring, synchronous example that I showed you earlier on. And guess what? It is 100% asynchronous. It looks the same as it did 15 years ago, only this one is blazing fast because it doesn't block threads at any of the points where it's waiting for information to go on. So this is almost a bit anticlimactic. Like I wanna show you some cool loom code. <laughs> there is no such thing as cool loom code. Cool loom code is boring, boring Java code that's synchronous. That's really how profound this change is. Now there's lots of ways Project Loom could have been done. This is the way it should be done. It should be anticlimactic. It should be, you come in here and uh, you write what looks like ordinary code and Loom is doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes, making this 100% async. It's amazing. It's game changing. That's what it is. And if you look beyond this and think, wow, well, how would this change the landscape? then you're gonna be blown away by the possibilities. Like let's take actors. So actors have proven very successful in this world of building reactive applications because one of the problems that they solve is they're 100% async, they're non-blocking and they allow safe changes to state. Well, what if an actor is just a class whose methods are all synchronized? Well, we're not far off even though the synchronized keyword is not going to be non-blocking now. I think it actually will be ultimately. But you can use something like stamp lock. You can use any of the locks in Java Util concurrent. Just lock on every method. You know, just lock. Or if you're generating these programmatically using, you know, an, an actor library, you can imagine generating the, the lock code so you don't have to by using a proxy. So you can just implement your business logic and then it's going to treat it as, you know, lock before, unlock afterward. You, you can design code that is 100% async. So this is async. Lots of different clients can call increment. It's all, it's all gonna be done as asynchronously. That's amazing. And that will open up new possibilities in the landscape of possible designs that can exist post Loom. There's now a whole bunch of holes that no one has ever explored. And that's gonna be really, really fascinating for library authors to explore that space. Anyway, actors, really, an actor is just an object that engages in message, message, pan, pass, message passing, passing, I'm sorry, I can't even speak correctly today, message passing. Um, and that's what Loom gives us because every time you call a method, it could be asynchronous, even if it, it's a synchronous return. It, that's just an amazing fact. Not just actors, of course, but there are these things called generators in Python and generators are a little mind blowing. 
So take a look at this Fibonacci generator. This Fibonacci generator just has a wild true loop. This is, this is a loop, the type of loop that they say you should never write because it never ends. And this loop, all it does is it computes every single Fibonacci number. Uh, so of course it has to, has to do while true because it has to compute all of them. There's no limit to the number of Fibonacci numbers that this thing can compute. Um, but the interesting thing is when you call yield A, this actually tells Python, hey, this thing is, is a generator. And now you can iterate over Fibonacci. You can treat it as an iterator. And so you can call, you can call it and you get back an iterator. You call next on the iterator and you can consume the first 10 things. And what it does is it basically inverts the, the, the control here so that Fibonacci no longer has control every time it has yield and, and pulls out a value or emits a value that will be consumed by X next. Um, but the code will be suspended at that point and it will not resume until you pull out the next one. So this is amazing. So there are certain situations in which you just wanna write a bunch of imperative code and you know dump stuff out, but then you only want your, the, your code to run as far as is needed on the other end. It allows you to do lazy, like lazy streams. Generators allow you to do lazy streams and all kinds of other crazy cool things. Well, this was impossible. You could not do this. I'm sorry, but Java did, does not have the generator feature. And there's no other combination of features that lets you do this in Java. You can't write ordinary imperative synchronous Java code and get this out. If you wanna do something like this, you have to use lots of heavyweight machinery in order to accomplish it. It doesn't look the same as the Python counterpoint. Well, post Loom, we have generators. Actually, we have a feature that's way more powerful that allows us to do generators as well as many other things. To solve this problem, let's just turn to our handy friend on blocking queue, which is in Java Util Concurrent. Like everything else in Java Util Concurrent, this is non-blocking. So honestly, they should rename this to non-blocking queue because now it's non-blocking, right? Everything is, is non-blocking. So uh, how you implement this is you just have a while true loop and you keep on stuffing things into the queue forever and ever and ever. And then on the other side, you, you create a new iterator that uses an array blocking queue and feeds that to the other one and you generate the fibs in a virtual thread. So now every time it hits Q offer, your virtual thread hits Q offer, it's going to suspend until there's room in the queue. And this one only has room for one item. So it's gonna compute one thing. And so the iterator that we end up returning from fibs, it pulls these things one at a time. So it allows you to essentially convert huge amounts of like imperative code um, that are just emitting values and continuing and into something that will be executed lazily. You can pull those things out and they just suspend automat or resume and suspend automatically based on what you need at the time. So this is going to, generators are going to not only simplify cases like this, but also they're going to lead to new approaches to streaming and many other things. Like we, we can't yet predict all of the uses that this inversion of control will have on our applications, but we can say that they'll probably be quite likely significant. All right, so that's a lot of, that's a lot of cool. That is a lot of cool, but Loom will have limitations when it ships. And I wanna briefly talk about some of them. I actually think probably all of them are temporary. I hope all of them will be temporary because something, something this amazing, we need to push it all the way through. We need this to be, um, a hundred percent full stack. But for now, anytime you use synchronized machinery or you use object weight or weight all, then that's going to be blocky. So there's no attempt going to be made to change that. But when, when that does happen, you literally will be able to make an actor by synchronizing on all your methods. That's an async actor right there with its own queue. Um, and how simple that is, is just amazing. Java net inet address. So that involves some rather heavy duty machinery that currently calls out to a native code. And native code is in general going to be blocking still. If you call native code that calls back into your code, that's gonna be blocking. And that's not gonna change ever probably. Um, but the INET address thing, it probably will change because you can implement those, we could implement those uh, facilities in Java itself. We don't need to rely on the operating systems, um, DNS resolver and so forth. Uh, process pipes on Windows. So whenever you use uh, process to call out to other, other things, then um, there's going to be some limitations there that are still going to do blocking. File IO, unfortunately, is still going to be blocking. And that's because uh, it apparently uses a lot of code is based on um, using um, buffered 
streams and buffered streams report uh, the, the current number of bytes that have been unread. So it's a little awkward to, to go in there. I don't know all the implications of going in there and changing that, but there might be some breakage. And so uh, probably not much is going to be done about that in the short term. Instead, there's going to be more attempt to give the underlying scheduler information that what it might be doing could be blocking. And so uh, fork join thread pool, for example, will try to do a better job managing that blocking IO. Um, and, and also, it, it should be smoothed over. At the, at the edges, it should be smoothed over. But all the NIO stuff is non-blocking. So anything built on, on NIO, so all these network libraries that are built on NIO, 100% non-blocking after Loom. And then uh, preemption is something that is not currently, uh, currently implemented and won't be for the first version. So preemption is where, what if you have a fiber in a while true loop that's just adding numbers or something like that and not interacting with any of Java util concurrent or anything else that interacts with any of the stuff in there. In that case, that, that uh, virtual thread will actually consume a real thread forever. Now that's not necessarily desirable. Honestly, to make this a truly green thread solution, we need preemption. So we need the ability to see, oh, this virtual thread's running for a long time. We need to preempt it. We need to forcibly take its power away and switch over to something else. We can't do that right now. And we won't be able to do that in the first version of Loom. So these limitations, they are unfortunate. But if you look at them, honestly, they are not catastrophic. We will still be able to do an amazing number of incredible things, even with these limitations in place. Because all the NIO stuff, all of Java Util concurrent, this is truly something to be excited about, even with this set of limitations. And again, if this if this catches on and becomes as successful as I think and hope it will be, then all of these all of these limitations, they'll have the resources necessary to make sure that they get fixed. So Loom, it is definitely going to change things. But one of the questions that we have to talk about tonight is, how much is it going to change things? What is it not going to change? And to do that, oops. We have, to, we have to talk about reactive programming. So what is the future of reactive programming? Does this mean Loom is going to kill it all? There's not going to be any more re reactive programming left after this? Maybe. Honestly, we need to break reactive down into the different concerns that it has. So reactive, I mean, re, there's reactive programming, which is more data flow. And then there's this sort of a reactive manifesto and reactive modern apps, which means something slightly different. They're both very related, but ultimately this word reactive has come to be associated with building applications that are responsive, they're resilient, they're message driven, they're elastic. And there's lots of different pieces in here. And we have to ask ourselves the question, which ones which aspects does Loom address? And which ones does it not really go towards? So in my estimation, Loom's greatest impact is gonna be on sort of message driven. So remember in, in Smalltalk objects, uh, you don't call methods so much as you send objects messages. And it's really interesting that decades after Smalltalk, Java is almost incidentally returning that to that notion of, oh, well, actually calling a, a method is really just like sending it a message that's becoming more true post Loom because these things can be you know async potentially. So uh, in my opinion, the message driven aspect of reactive programming is the one that's going to be most significant to change. A lot of frameworks, they are designed to help us program in this async style because that's what we need to do in order to achieve low latency and high throughput. We can't block all these threads like we could in the good old days of 10 concurrent connections a second. So we need to change things. These frameworks help us. They have a lot of machinery in them. So take the actor paradigm, for example, which um, basically allows us to program in the context of what are essentially objects that send each other messages. A lot of that machinery helps us build async applications, but also it's foreign and we have to learn it and we have to integrate with it. We need libraries for it. So there's a good amount of that stuff that's probably gonna go away or at least it will reappear in a totally different form that's gonna be more natively integrated into a post-Loom world. Um, and, but also, so there's gonna be some aspects of resiliency. So a lot of these reactive programming libraries, they help us with error handling. And the reason for that is 
because when you switch over to async programming, error management becomes enormously tricky. You have non-local errors. The, the, the portion that, that spawned the computation ends up spawning something that spawns something that, you know, ultimately there's an error somewhere and there's a callback somewhere and who knows where it ends up. So a lot of the machinery in these frameworks is targeted at improving resiliency in the face of the asynchronous way of coding. And um, in addition, there's some element of responsiveness that, that is geared around, okay, making your application async and concurrent so it can be very, very responsive. It needs to be responsive. Latency needs to be low. It needs to be highly scalable. That's more an aspect of Elastic. So Loom will have impact on all of these buckets. Now, that said, it is not going to eliminate the need for other machinery. And that's because Loom is, is primarily about async programming. So the components of reactive programming that are devoted to, that are inspired by, or that exist because of async programming, those are going away. Those will change radically in a post-Loom world. Um, and I'll, even, so even, not just those, by the way, but even concurrent programming. So concurrent programming, we might say, well, how is that going to change in a post-Loom world? Like we can all see that Loom is going to eliminate the need for callbacks and is going to allow us to program in a style that looks synchronous, but it's totally async. That's a good thing. Universally, that's a great thing. It's not so obvious to see how it might change concurrent programming, but it will change concurrent programming. Now, I want to argue that it's not going to change concurrent programming that much and that there's still a big space in the ecosystem for reactive solutions that address the things that Loom does not address. So that's not any fault of Loom. Loom is not designed to solve every problem in the world. Loom is designed to solve the green threading problem and it, and it does, it solves that very well. But as a consequence of the fact that it's change things considerably, it will impact adjacent areas. So we're gonna go through this section and I'm gonna show you uh, first off that Loom will impact concurrent programming, but also there's still big spaces that need to be filled by something. And of course I'm, I'm the author of Zio. So this is a chance for me to pitch Zio a little bit. I'm sorry, I had to sneak that in somehow. So you're, you're welcome. So async programming and Java util concurrent, historically they've been separate things. And that's because all of the sort of battle tested production worthy, you know, highly optimized stuff in Java Util Concurrent, that's been synchronous. Like you can't, in your shiny new reactive framework, you, you can't really leverage all of the blocking stuff inside Java Util Concurrent. You know, queues, we've got blocking queues that could wait minutes before they return. They could hog a thread for minutes. We've got locks, which could also wait minutes. We've got condition variables. We've got all sorts of things. And they all block threads for arbitrary long periods of time. Um, so for a while now, the Java util concurrent stuff, even though it's been great, great concurrency primitives, it's existed in a separate world from the world of async programming. Those worlds don't mix. They haven't mixed, at least up until now. But after Loom, guess what happens? These two worlds collide because every single thing in Java Util concurrent becomes asynchronous. All of the locks, reentrant lock, stamp lock, read write lock, um, all of the uh, the concurrent data structures like concurrent blocking, concurrent array blocking queue and link blocking queue and so on and so forth, they all become async. That's amazing because now we can leverage them from async programming without having to pay for the the extra threads that we never really wanted to pay for to begin with. But that doesn't mean Java Util Concurrent is, is powerful. It is production worthy, but that doesn't mean that it is the solution to all problems in concurrency, far from it. In fact, I'm going to argue that Java Util Concurrent is low level and in a reactive world, we've become accustomed to working, at least some of us have become accustomed to working at a higher level. We no longer need to use the low level stuff in there. Some of that stuff could be useful as implementation details of the libraries that we end up using, but fundamentally we don't necessarily need to use anything in there directly. 
I'll give you some examples. So locks are a reliable primitive for building concurrent systems. Unfortunately, they have some massive drawbacks. And one, one of their drawbacks, one of their massive drawbacks is the fact that even though locks allow you to make safe changes to structures, nonetheless, uh, locks don't compose. And what I mean by that is if you have one lock guarding access to one structure and you have another lock guarding access to another structure, if you want to make changes to both of these structures at the same time, you can't simply lock one and then lock the other. Actually, you're asking for deadlocks. If you write lots of code like that, ultimately you're, you're going to deadlock your application and you're not going to understand what happened. The, what happened is, is basically you can't acquire two locks simultaneously. Not yet anyway. Maybe some future version of Java Util Concurrent will have composable locks, but right now we don't have composable locks. So you're gonna deadlock your application. Now, in a library like Zio, and of course there's other approaches to solving the same problem, but in a library like Zio, we actually get compositional transactionality. So we can update as many structures as we want concurrently in the context of a transaction. And then we can commit that transaction. Where are the locks? There are no locks. Locks are an implementation detail. They're super low level. Why program at the level of locks when what a programmer wants to program at is the level of a transaction? We want to say, make this change, make this change, and make this change all in a transaction that either succeeds or, or fails. Commit that transaction, and we're done. That's the way we want to program. And Java Util Concurrent does not let us program that way. But modern libraries like Zio, they do let us program that way. In addition, locks are actually only one part of the concurrency problem. You need two primitives in order to solve an arbitrary problem involving concurrency. You need a lock as well as a condition variable. And condition variables are things that you can, they're, they're variables, you can signal them or you can wait on them to be signaled. So you acquire a lock and then you either signal a condition variable or you acquire it and you wait on it to be signaled. This allows you to coordinate between different threads. So you need this mechanism. Absolutely, you need it to, to do a lot of things in concurrency. But it's very cumbersome and awkward because you have to create the lock. Then from the lock, you create the condition variable. And then you have to remember, you have to lock uh, that lock before you use the condition variable. And you have to create one condition variable for every different type of condition you're waiting on. It's no wonder that most programmers don't do concurrent programming because it's just too hard. It's too, it's too tricky to get right. So what modern libraries like Zio do is they take their inspiration from Haskell and from compositional functional programming. They, they allow us to do declarative signaling. So instead of creating condition variables, we just check that our conditions are satisfied. And these are ordinary function, you know, STM check. We're gonna check that the size is less than 10 and we'll continue in our transaction when it is. And so our transaction just suspends at that point until that condition is satisfied. And when it is satisfied, our transaction will continue. This allows us to solve in a compact, ele elegant, compositional, and deadlock-free way problems that we wouldn't even attempt using the lower level primitives like lock and condition variable. In addition, Java Util Concurrent is, at least, uh, at least as far as, as we know now, is not going to support structured concurrency by default. You will be able to do structured concurrency with Java Util Concurrent post alone. But the way you do that is really uh, very explicit and very manual. So you create basically a worker thread pool and you do that in a try block and then you use that to, to submit additional tasks and then it's in the try block. When that try block finishes, it shuts down all of its virtual threads. And so you end up achieving a sort of virtual concurrency. In my opinion, this is, this is not what people want when they hear structured concurrency. It's just so manual. It's so, it's so fixated on low level implementation details. So in contrast that with Zio. So anytime you start a virtual thread in Zio by calling fork on an effect, so that forks off a new virtual thread, that is structured by default. So when its parent ends life, the child will end life as well. You get that by default out of the box. And if you want another semantic, you can achieve that through a uh, compositional operator. So any possible semantic you, you want, you could achieve by using these operators. But nonetheless, what you get out of the box by default is um, a solution that automatically ensures that when you're done, all of your children will will be terminated. That is in general what you want. And that gives you nice reasoning properties. You know, when you exit the scope here, 
that all of your children say say bye bye to your children because they're all going to be they're all going to be interrupted. That's the ideal behavior for structured concurrency. It lets us reason about resource usage of virtual threads and ensures we don't have things running on in the background that are no longer doing things that we want them to be doing. And you, you see that not just here in Zio, but pervasively. So if you try to do things in parallel or um, in any situation like that, you race two things, Zio will always terminate things that don't need to be done. And it will always wait before it returns until those things have been safely terminated. So you have predictable resource consumption. You get all of those wonderful, clean, structured concurrency semantics for free by default out of a solution like Zio. You don't really with, with Java Util Concurrent, even with the work they're doing around making support for that paradigm possible. Resource handling is another big one. So in resource handling, it's going to be possible to use a try with resources, so that the construct over on the left-hand side to acquire resources, which may be asynchronous, and um, they will be safely released. However, this is uh, not compositional resource handling. So there's actually um, some edge cases and bugs, which they're trying to smooth over by supporting a new variant of this try with resources that will, that will look for an open method. So they're trying to fix some problems, but ultimately some problems cannot be solved. And an example of one problem that cannot be solved is, what if we want to open two things in parallel? That can't be done. You can't have parallel try blocks. You, you can't split your column editor into two and have two parallel try blocks. Programs don't work that way. Try doesn't work that way. So you have to decide which of these to do uh, first. So in a library like Zio, it's very easy. If you want to do two things in, at once, you just zip them together in parallel. And, and now you can use those two resources. And that behaves correctly and exactly as you would expect. So both of them are acquired in release, are acquired in parallel, and they're released in parallel. And if anything goes wrong when you're using the resources, then of course things are safely cleaned up. If one thing succeeds, but the other one does, does not succeed, if it fails, then the one that succeeded will be safely closed. So it works perfectly out of the box. You don't have to think about resource handling and you can achieve higher, higher throughput, lower latency, higher performance by doing parallel resource acquisition. And let's say you want to open in parallel an arbitrary list of resources. So maybe your list contains five things, but it, maybe it contains 10, you don't know how many. How would you do try on a list of things? That doesn't work. Try only works with static lexical scoping. So you need to know in advance how many things you're going to be trying. You can't just do like a 4-H loop in parallel and open them all. Well, with Zio, you can. You can actually do a 4-H loop in parallel and just open them all at the same time and then use them later um, as a list of open resources. And if anything goes wrong, everything is safely cleaned up. Also, interruption in even in a post-loom world it's beset by some legacy problems. And one of these legacy problems is what happens if we need to do, let's say we, we want to try to do some main work and if we're interrupted, so if the thread gets an interrupted exception, which can happen at any point, really, um, as soon as you use anything in Java Util Concurrent or, or NIO, you might get an interrupted exception, then we need to do some cleanup. But let's say as part of that cleanup, we need to do a lock or something. Uh-oh, what's going to happen? Well, if the thread that interrupted us is still interrupting us, then our cleanup operation can be interrupted. As a result, Java cannot offer guarantees about safe cleanup. And that's because of the way the interruption model works with Java Lang thread. Now, there's some talk about maybe refactoring that interruption model. But even if it's refactored, it's unlikely to ever be compositional. You might solve this one specific problem, but there are other problems you'll see in a second that will definitely not be solved. So in Zio, if you, if you want to do something and then ensure you do a cleanup, you just write, do your main work and ensuring you do the cleanup. And then the cleanup one will not be interrupted. Even if the virtual thread that's running that code is interrupted, that interruption signal, it will not be allowed to interrupt the, the finalizer that's doing the cleanup. So you get all of these safe semantics that have guaranteed resource cleanup out of the box. And that comes from compositional interruption. How about something this mind blowing? So something like this far out, it's not even in the roadmap. I, I don't even think you could integrate this into the JVM's thread model. Let's say you want a whole block of your code to be uninterruptible, but in a certain tiny region, you want to allow it to be interruptible. 
And let's say in that interruptible region, you have another region inside there that you don't want it to be interrupted. And let's say that 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 stack just keeps on going deeper and deeper. Well, you're out of luck. There's no possible way, no none whatsoever that you could ever even hope. You can't even think about implementing that on top of Java Threads interrupt, interruption mechanism. And that's because you don't have compositional interruption. The big story behind functional effect libraries like Zio is compositionality, compositionality. It allows us to program without edge cases. We can snap these pieces together in beautiful ways with principled semantics and we can know what we get out of that because it, these things are defined mathematically, algebraically, they have very nice properties that allow us to reason about this software. And it gives us capabilities to do things that we could never even imagine. For example, we wanna make, we wanna make pulling from a queue interruptible because we don't necessarily want to wait around forever on that. But then once we have that item from the queue, we want to handle that. Yeah, good luck writing that using Java Util Concurrent and the Java Lang Thread interruption model. It's not possible and it's never going to be possible. And there's more. So if we're looking for a story that helps us handle flakiness, in modern applications, as well as repetitions or retries and repetitions, there's nothing in Java Util Concurrent that can really help with that. You know, try catch is the, is the blunt hammer that you're given. You don't have anything else beyond that. And in functional effect libraries like Zio, you can literally just call retry and give it a schedule. And these schedules are defined compositionally. They're type safe. They are defined in a declarative fashion. So in this particular example, there's an exponential schedule that continues until the spacing between the recurrences is exceeds 60 seconds. And there's another one that is the intersection of two schedules, one that recurs for 100 times and another one that puts spacing of 60 seconds between recurrences. So you intersect those two schedules and you get one that recurs for 100 times with 60 seconds spacing between all the recurrences. And then those two are put together in sequence using the and then operator. So we do the first schedule and then the second schedule. And then we wrap that all in dot jittered, which adds a random amount of jitter. And then we call, we call some API and we call retry on that. And that gives us a, a new functional effect that can end up retrying the first one. So all this power comes from compositionality. It comes from the heart and soul of functional programming. And all of this is, is power that remains inaccessible to the world of Java Util Concurrent. Um, also recursion. So this is another biggie. It's it's not really important for uh, a lot of programmers, but if you're used to writing re recursive code, one of the nice properties that libraries like Zio give you that is not going to be given to you by Project Loom is that your recursive code can loop forever. It can call itself forever and it never blows the stack. That's a very important property because it allows you to build custom control flow operators. For example, if you want to build your own function that takes effect and returns another effect that just loops forever, it's easy to do that. Just take that effect and chain it with itself. And then you have an effect that will run forever. And that will not blow the stack. In fact, that consumes almost no stack and a constant amount of heap, tiny amount of heap. Such things are trivial in um, functional effect libraries. They're not possible right now uh, in the JVM, not without tail calls. Tail calls would be necessary. And in a more general case, mutually recursive tail calls would be necessary. Who knows if that's, that was originally, tail calls at least were originally on the spec for Loom, but that's been deferred. So we, we, we might not ever see that, who knows. So there's way more stuff that, way more problems that Loom does not solve that you run into. An example would be, uh, thread local context. So thread locals, they are getting upgraded to be fiber aware, which is great, but also they have tons of problems. And a lot of these problems stem from the fact that thread locals can contain uh, mutable variables. So that imposes limitations on the way they can be implemented. If you're willing to say your thread locals should only contain immutable values, then suddenly it opens up a world of uh, compositional properties for thread local like things. So you can say, okay, every time a a child virtual thread is started from a parent thread that it will receive a copy of its thread locals. And not only can you say that, but you can allow people to modify those copies anytime where the parent thread spins up a new child virtual thread. And you can also say if a parent thread joins the child thread that those two thread locals should be merged together in a user-defined fashion. So you can create really beautiful, beautiful semantics 
that can do all the things we want to do with thread locals, like tracing and correlation IDs and all sorts of stuff like that, which we want to be able to do in our applications that we really can't do with thread locals, not without edge cases and nulls and thrown exceptions and all that. And yes, there will be some effort to improve this using a new construct called scope, but scope does not solve all the problems. It solves some of them. It solves a few of them. But ultimately, the solution to these problems is beyond the scope of Loom. In addition, we get in libraries like Zia, we get inherited execution traces. So you can see where the parent came from. I, I actually think that one day that will be um, in the JVM because um, the authors of Loom know how important that is to be able to diagnose the problem. Because if you spin off a new virtual thread, it may have a very short um, stack trace. You don't want that short stack trace, you want the lineage. You wanna see where it came from. So that's an important step for diagnosing problems. I think that will eventually happen, but you can have it today in, in libraries like Zio. Hierarchical thread supervision. So the ability to say, I want to supervise everything that is started beneath this level. You can, you can do that in Zio. You're, you're not gonna be able to do that in Loom. Lossless error model. So the JVM by its very nature is a lossy error model. If you throw from a try and throw from a finally, you only get to catch the thing thrown from the finally. So you lose a lot of errors. And especially if you do like parallel composition and stuff, you need to hold on to all this stuff if you wanna know what went wrong. It makes diagnosing issues a whole lot easier. CEO gives you a lossless error model. And then we haven't even talked about streams. Obviously I think that generators and the fact that uh, we, can, we can sort off these virtual threads has big implications for streaming libraries, but streams themselves, even though an iterator is a kind of stream, and actually we're probably gonna see um, more uses of ordinary Java util iterator, collection iterator, in order to uh, model streams because now they can be async and even concurrent. Um, but nonetheless, streams carry other things with them, like for example, resource handling. And if you wanna be efficient, you have to do built-in chunking. So you, you need lots of things in there. And obviously that's way beyond the scope of Loom. And it's a big space for where existing libraries have a chance to, to innovate, especially if they're targeting the reactive space. So ultimately I see Loom as an incredible foundation for building higher level constructs on top of, like Zio. And I would expect actually out there, if you're using one of these reactive libraries like Rx Java, or um, actually some of them will probably go away, honestly. So things like Quasar, they might go away entirely, but a lot of these will survive. They'll just change, they'll change a lot. And that's because they don't need to duplicate any functionality in Loom. They can come to rely on that. And also the features of Loom are so powerful and so game-changing, they open up new ways to do things that currently are impossible. And they'll open up a level of accessibility that just means you don't have to be an advanced programmer in order to write some really good code. So that's tremendously exciting. And as, as one of the contributors to the Zio library, I can say that I am very much looking forward to Loom. I think it's done right. It's definitely a badly needed project um, in the JVM at this juncture. I'm very excited to see this work. And I, I already know, having studied Loom at length and played around with it, I already know some of the ways that it's going to be changing functional effect libraries like, like Zio. And one of the big ways is no native async nodes. So right now, the most complicated part of any um, functional effect system is the need to support asynchronicity. And so you have a certain node in your in your data type that is a model of a functional effect that is designed specifically for handling async stuff. And that adds a lot of complexity and slows down performance and does other things that is just not gonna be necessary anymore. There's a massive simplification coming to the runtime systems of functional effect systems that will be possible in a post Loom world. In addition, Loom allows you to plug in custom schedulers. That's desirable for libraries like Zio, which work with a higher level of abstraction so they have more insight into what's going on and you can plug in a custom scheduler with Loom. So Zio will be able to take advantage of that to schedule virtual threads according to its own needs. And then also in what may be a, a surprise, uh, I think ultimately Zio will have a run function on it. The reason why that run function is not exposed right now, it's kind of hidden away in a runtime is because of the over, is because we don't wanna encourage people to block threads that leads to deadlocks, it slows down performance and so forth. But in a post loom world, you can imagine taking any of these concurrent workflows, just calling run on it and getting the value out. That's how simple it can be to run Zio effects in a post loom world. So all of that is, is super exciting uh, for the future of libraries like Zio. 
So in summary, threads have changed the world and also CPUs have, have changed the world because they stopped getting faster and they just started multiplying the number of things they could do at the same time. And as a result of an early decision in the JVM, we ended up in a situation of, of one JVM thread per operating system level thread, which meant all of our web frameworks and all of our code had to pay attention to the threads that it was creating. It couldn't create unbounded numbers and, not, and, and meet the needs that we have as a business to have high throughput and low latency and resiliency. So as a result, we saw the emergence of a lot of data types and abstractions and libraries and frameworks designed at making it easier to build highly responsive, reactive, high throughput, low latency applications. And that's where Reactive was born. And Reactive, it's, it's done a lot of good things, obviously, uh, but ultimately th there's a part of Reactive programming that's working around a feature or a lack of a feature or a misfeature, whatever you want to call it, baked in early into the JVM. And finally, finally, after uh, three years, so Loom has been in development for about three years, um, Project Loom is bearing fruits. And it's showing us that we don't necessarily have to live with the legacy decisions of the JVM. And it's introducing us to a boring style of programming that still has the possibility to be low latency and high throughput and resilient. And it's going to take all the constructs right now that are unusable, control flow constructs and, and uh, air handling and resource safety, and it's going to transport them into the async world suddenly all that stuff, it's just gonna work with async code because there will be no distinction between sync and async code. You will program without having to know about threads. And that is a good thing. That's the way it should be. Ultimately, we never should have had to know about the distinction between sync and async. Ultimately, there should never be such a thing as a callback based API. Uh, that should not happen. Um, and post Loom, we can return to that vision of what, a, what the world should be like. Now that said, Loom's going to change a lot of things, but it does have some limitations. Most of these limitations will hopefully be smoothed out over time. That's my hope. And there's, there's stated interest to work on a lot of the issues that I mentioned that would, that would be limitations. Where does that leave the world of reactive programming? Well, I think that that's subjective. It's, it's an opinion. In my opinion, Loom does actually touch on all of the key areas of reactive programming. And it's going to change a lot. It's definitely going to change without question. You can't even argue with this one that it's going to change anything that touches async. And that means paradigms and libraries and frameworks that were created to deal with the async problem are going to change. Some of them may end up going away. If they only existed for async programming, they're dead on arrival because there's no need for them. Nonetheless, there are certain areas, even areas touched by Loom, that will remain unsolved problems. They will remain areas where we need higher level abstractions. Example would be streaming libraries. I think streaming libraries, even though they'll be implemented quite differently in a post-loom world, they'll be simpler and they'll be better. Nonetheless, they will continue to exist because people like to work at the level of streams. They don't like to work at the level of iterators. Iterators are too low level for solving a lot of problems. And even concurrency where we're going to see for the first time in history, a huge number of, of really solid concurrent structures just instantly become async, which is amazing. Even though we get access to all of that in our async code, ultimately that's, that's not going to diminish the need for better solutions for concurrency because it's hard to build concurrent applications that have strong guarantees around resource uses, usage and efficiency and deadlocks that are declarative, that are easy to maintain and libraries that step into that space and try to provide good solutions while embracing all of the features that Looms provide, they stand to actually benefit from a post Loom world. And hopefully I, I've given you a taste of what that could look like uh, in a library like Zio, but obviously there's lots of other libraries out there that you could investigate that will continue to go undergo evolution in a post-loom world. All right, so with that said, we are winding to a close and I have to put in a plug for my friends at Evolution Gaming. So Evolution Gaming made this talk possible. I wanna thank them. And I also want to let you know that they are hiring. They are hiring in Riga and in Tallinn and in Amsterdam and in Minsk. So they are hiring everywhere. You can go to evolution.com.jobs and you're gonna find one of the finest group of engineers that I've had the pleasure to work with and to meet. So I, I had the pleasure 
in a pre-pandemic world uh, last year to fly to all of their offices. Well, not Minx, but Riga and, oh no, not Talent, but the but Riga and Amsterdam and Minx. And oh, it was amazing. It was amazing to meet with the team there and to tech talk, to geek out with the other engineers. I had so much fun. And then walking around these cities, they're all beautiful in their own way. And I, I just have to say that they're a great group of people. And even though I work for myself, uh, which I quite like, if I weren't working for myself, Evolution Gaming would be one of the few companies that I would be happy to work with. I would definitely consider working with these fine folks. So if you are in the market for a job, and if you like cutting edge stuff, if you like doing stuff that really is, is at the edge on the JVM, and, and if you're intrigued by Scala or Zio or any of that, this is the company you need to be working for. I'm telling you that. So hop on over there, apply for one of these jobs, and tell them that John sends you, because I did. And then also, if you want to learn more about Zio, um, me and a colleague of mine, Adam Frazier, have come out with this really uh, great book. At least it has a great website. I hope the book is as great as the website, but the, the web des website designer did a great job on the website called Zionomicon where you can master the dark arts of programming, concurrent applications that are type safe, resource safe, deadlock free using the ZL library, which is a Scala library. Yeah, it, it sucks if you're in Java, I'm sorry, but um, you can read it and, and look forward fondly to your days as, as a Scala engineer when you hop on over to evolution.com slash jobs and apply for one of their Scala jobs. All right, so thank you so much for the opportunities to speak with you. I've had a lot of fun. And now I'm going to open it up for questions. And also remember, we have that free ticket to give away to Functional Scala. So Functional Scala 2020 is gonna be great. And you know for a fact that you want one of these t-shirts, right? Because I want 10 of them. That's how many I want. <laughs> the, the designer, I, I love that design, it's awesome. So uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. Let me figure out how to use Zoom and uh, Zoom questions. All right, I got it open. So a question, shouldn't the OS make threads cheaper so that all programming language implementations can use them directly and don't have to reinvent the wheel? So that's a really good question. And my answer is no. And the reason is, in my opinion, the operating system itself it has to take its finite resources and it has to chop it up among all the processes. And it honestly, it doesn't know how every process is going to use them. It has to be what would be called a dumb scheduler. So the scheduler in an operating system, it has to be fairly dumb. It can't be smart. And um, also it, it has to make choices like how much stack size do you need per thread and other sorts of things like that. Um, so it's, it's going to be very dumb. It's going to be very generic. It's going to be far away from the user code. Now, on the other hand, a process which has been compiled using some compiler from a programming language with its own runtime, it can, in theory, know what its programs are doing. It's, it's not just machine code at that point. It can know characteristics about them. It can know, um, ultimately, ultimately, in my opinion, every process should be creating a number of threads equal to the number of cores on the machine. And it should only ever use that. And it should interact with the operating system in non-blocking ways um, in order to do IO. And it should only ever utilize that. It should always offer green threads. Uh, but the operating system itself, rather than, than trying to be all things to all processes, remember, uh, like Erlang is very different thing than Java. The uh, actors in Erlang, they have different life cycle, different usage characteristics. They need a different scheduler than a scheduler written for Java. So different languages, different different ways of programming even, they need different schedulers in order to extract maximum performance. That means the generic scheduler in your operating system, it's just never gonna have enough information. It doesn't know how to, how to do a, a good job for everyone. So it will settle doing a mediocre job for everyone. So even, even though I obviously think operating systems should make their threads faster, right? Everything should be faster, including operate, operating system threads. But, but also I think that the correct architectural design decision is to make sure that every process can can do its own green threading uh, via the language runtime. Another question, it looks like Java wants to, it looks like Java wants to achieve anything. It adds a layer and boom functionality achieved. Same here, added virtual thread on top of the same one. Is it all about adding layers? <laughs> Sadly, yes. And there's part of my brain that's like, 
and let's just start from the ground up. We're going to start with the CPU because let's face it, it's broken. We need new CPUs that are designed based on graph rewriting uh, so we can have efficient implementations for pure functional programming languages, among other things. Of course, we'll have to reinvent the operating system and the languages and, and the version control systems and all of that. Um, but, but also, we live in the real world. And there's another bigger part of my brain that says, yeah, it kind of sucks all the legacy we have to deal with. But if we don't deal with it, someone else will, and they'll eat our lunch. And Oracle is very uh, aware of that. And what they're doing is they're adding another layer. And this other layer, its cleverness is actually the fact that it, it is another layer. It doesn't break anything. It just adds more stuff to the pile. That, that's why we have C++ running in WASM, you know, WebAssembly running in, in browsers, running on operating systems, running in Docker containers, running in virtualized uh, operating system. That's, that's the tower of cards that we live in because it's always easier and it makes more business sense to add a new layer on top. So in, in a ideal world, maybe we wouldn't do that. In the real world, doing this is how you be, it's how you stay relevant and Oracle wisely sees that in my opinion. Uh, what about volatile? Will it work the same? Yes, so it will work the same. So no, no changes in how volatile will work, which is important for backward compatibility. What is the performance of writing generators in the way shown compared to writing an iterator in the old way? So um, it, there, will, there will be a performance cost to writing a generator in the way that I show, because basically the virtual thread who's running your code may suspend when it reaches that Q offer, if there's not enough room in there. So if it suspends, then that means it's not being executed, which means some thread, physical thread, is going to be doing work. So that's not going to be um, as efficient as writing an iterator in the old fashioned way where you manually keep track of all those details. That said, I don't think that it will matter for a lot of applications, especially as Loom is optimized. I, I think that style of programming where you're basically assuming that this is gonna be efficient enough for all practical purposes is going to become more pervasive because it's hard to argue with the productivity benefits of that. Another question, what do you mean exactly that previously blocking will be non-blocking with Loom? Um, okay, so th this is this is an interesting question, right? If you call thread sleep, thread sleep won't return until after it sleeps. When I say non-blocking, I mean that no operating system level thread will be parked waiting for that amount of time to elapse. So that's an important distinction. Basically thread blocking versus semantic blocking. Post loom, things will still semantically block. If you call if you call lock on a lock, it's gonna semantically block that line of code. It will not continue past that line of code until after, after the lock has been acquired. And it's the same way for offer or for sleep or any of these. So it's going to semantically block. You'll look like it and think, yeah, you know, it blocks, but it's just not blocking. It's blocking, if you will, it's blocking a virtual thread, <laughs> which has no cost. It's not blocking an operating system thread. Now there's slightly different terminology. Usually you would say the virtual thread suspended, it entered you know, a suspended mode, but it's okay to think of that as virtual blocking for a virtual thread. Another question, using Loom, a lot of computations may become lazy. It's very easy to suspend some computations. Wouldn't that lead to issues with memory consumption similar to those that we have in Haskell sometimes, which are relatively hard to debug. I think that's a good question. I think as people use, um, first off, Loom won't, won't necessarily make things, well, they'll become lazy in the sense that you have a bunch of virtual threads that are not doing anything and that will do something later. And I think you're right that that's gonna lead to a lot increased memory consumption because you'll just have continuous connections open with all clients, you know, web sockets, you'll just have gobs of, of fibers just sitting out there waiting to resume with their own stacks. It's gonna lead to that style of programming where you use these with reckless abandon, which will increase memory consumption times. And I do think that that will make things harder to debug. That's something that uh, the authors of Loom have talked about, which is how do you do a thread dump when you have a million threads? Well, you don't. 
pretty much you don't you don't dump a million threads how can you do that you need some hierarchy you need some way to make those diagnosing problems tractable because it's not going to be tractable with the old school paradigm of doing a thread dump seeing which ones are blocked seeing what their stack traces are at the current moment in time that doesn't scale Uh, is there a change in memory model and in monitoring objects? So no, everything will work the same way that it works now. Um, lock support, that critical low level class in Java Util Concurrent has been changed and now that becomes fiber aware. And as a consequence, or sorry, virtual thread aware, uh, as a consequence, many other things um, come along for free. Uh, object synchronization and wait, wait all, that is not changing right now. It still behaves the same. From a memory barrier and synchronization perspective, nothing changes. What about structured concurrency like in Kotlin? So I hope I dealt with this question. I think this question was asked maybe earlier on. Um, the answer is that Loom is, is not going to, it's not gonna support structured concurrency by default. It will have a way for you to support structured concurrency by being very explicit about it. So it's opt-in structured concurrency. And is that what, what people want? I don't know. I, I actually, I think people would prefer to use Kotlin structured concurrency than to use uh, the structured concurrency support in Loom. Because in Kotlin, they had a chance to start from the ground up. And so they were able to build something that it, it has much more reasonable semantics. Whereas in Loom, they still have to deal with legacy concerns and these impose limitations on the way that you can you can um, chain, mix things up. That said, Kotlin, Kotlin has, has to figure out what's gonna happen uh, because the distinction between suspended procedures and non-suspended procedures leads to the, the two color function you know, you've probably heard about and no one wants to live in that world. So, so probably Colin itself maybe needs to change after Loom be, goes mainstream. Yeah, hopefully I answered how implementing Zio is going to improve. So the primary ways are that Zio will have no more async node, which is gonna be fantastic. Um, Zio will be able to use custom scheduler that will be virtual thread aware and it will be able to have a run method, a non-blocking run method on every Zio effect. So it's going to improve Zio in those ways, in addition to others that I didn't specify. There are aspects of Loom that can be used to provide the semantics that Zio does, for example, on top of fiber refs and other operations. How will Loom affect the potential for Scala native and Zio and Scala native? That's a good question. So. Loom is not going to solve the problem for languages like Kotlin and Scala, which are cross-platform. Loom only solves the async problem on the JVM. And this is, this is severely underrated. So for these platforms like Android and um, JavaScript and you know, native, which are important for other languages to support, Loom does not solve all problems in the world it's only gonna solve the subset of problems that happen on the JVM, which means that libraries like even like Zio, if Zio wants to continue supporting Scala native, then it means that there's going to be some code that only is, is designed for Scala native that does not take advantage of Loom features. And same way for Scala JS and, and same way for Kotlin on Scala and Android, they're gonna to have to keep on supporting other ways of solving these problems if they want to stay cross-platform. And I think it's pretty much a given that modern languages, they want to stay cross-platform because we're doing so much of our work on other platforms. How much will Zio will be able to rely on Loom given that it also wants to support Scala.js? I think the answer is we want to, we definitely want to rely on, we want to use every single thing in Loom. Now that's not to say we won't have separate source files for Scala native and Scala.js. We already do that. <laughs> so actually, Zio supports Scala 2.11, Scala 2.12, Scala 2.13, Scala 3, Scala JS, Scala native. Well, supports is maybe too strong there, but we compile on it. And as well as the JVM. 
how did we do that? We did it with lots of source files for the different targets, for the different platforms. It's only more of the same in the future. Obviously, we want 100% all in on Loom. There's no question. But to support the other platforms, we're going to need to have platform-specific code. In the context of Loom, would data that is visibly immutable to the JVM allow the JVM to be a better platform for concurrent and parallel programming? Especially thinking of memory hierarchy from registers to level three, et cetera, and giving the garbage collector more to work with. That's not Loom, actually. So Loom is not going to touch that. Um, but project, basically, uh, a mechanism is being incorporated, hopefully, into the JVM that allows us to freeze an object and say, this is never going to change. And the JVM can do lots of optimizations on such things in theory. So obviously, as Scala programmers, we would want to use that for case classes. Um, so that, that, that feature is part of one of the many things that are a part of Project Valhalla. You should look into that more if you're interested in how immutability could be leveraged by the JVM to improve performance. But the answer is, yes, it can be. Um, that's not part of Loom, though. So the conclusion, this is another person. So the conclusion is use Golang and be happy. <laughs> well, if you like Golang, then uh, certainly. The actual question is what will happen to Scala and its ecosystem after Loom release? So in my opinion, I have a somewhat biased opinion here, but I actually think that, um, that Loom will not disproportionately affect Scala because there's lots of async frameworks and libraries out there, even in Java. Um, so it's, it's going to have a more or less a uniform effect. And what it's going to do across that ecosystem is things that are mostly about async, they're going to die. Um, things that are mostly not about async, they're going to be able to do better. So I actually think that we'll see mixed results across Java. Like if you're looking at different libraries, different things are going to happen. And same way, Scala, we're going to see different things happen. I do think you're right. A strength of Scala programming is async programming. Is that enough of a strength? Honestly, if you look at Scala's future and you compare that to completion stage, there's not that much difference between them. So I don't think that Scala's future is, in particular, a strength of the Scala programming language anymore. I think it was at the time, but it went off to inspire things in Java. So I think Scala still does have a, an edge here for concurrent programming. If you look at concurrent programming and the intersection of concurrent programming with resources and yes, async right now, Scala is really powerful. It's amazingly powerful. And also Scala is on the verge of releasing Scala 3, which gives the language new powers of metaprogramming that you can't, you can't do this in Java. You would have to do, um, you'd have to use a bytecode instrumentation and other techniques in order to get the same power that it'll just be baked into the Scala programming language. So that's going to create new doors, especially for high performance microservices and, and data processing on Scala, which are already key strengths. Scala is used to build APIs, you know, GraphQL and REST APIs. It's used for microservices and it's used for data processing. And a lot of features in Scala 3 play to those strengths. Plus Scala already has I hope at the end you saw here, Scala in the form of Zio and other libraries, Scala has very compelling solutions to a wide range of concurrency problems that are never going to be affected by Loom. Loom just doesn't go there. You're all, uh, another question, I'm already using Zio. What will Loom do for you? Loom, Zio will be faster on Loom and it will be easier to use. So you'll be able to run effects anywhere um, in a non-blocking fashion. Uh, and a lot of things that right now are, are slower will, will become faster in a, in a post-Loom world. So basically keep on using it. You can benefit from fibers and all that stuff today. And then seamlessly when Loom is released, Zio will be using a virtual threads instead of its own fibers. So you'll just see performance improvements and a better interop with other Java code. You'll see lots of great improvements just by using Zio. How would I compare fibers, how they're implemented in Zio versus green threads in Loom? So the primary difference is that right now, libraries like Zio, they basically force you to allocate everything on the heap. That's because Zio doesn't have a way to save the stack and restore it. So these green threads, these virtual threads in 
in uh, Loom, they allow you to save and restore the stack. So that means you can actually use stack. You're not always just using heap. And stack is faster to use than heap, uh, significantly, noticeably faster. And, and also, it takes some effort, some energy to, to do this process, and it doesn't play as well. The trampolining process doesn't play as well with, uh, with uh, CPU caches. So you're going to see improvements in performance precisely because they are making modifications to the JVM that allow them to copy and restore stacks, basically. There will need to be changes in the Zio runtime in order to efficiently to, to support Loom as best as is possible. What do I think the impact of Project Loom is on Akka? Well, Akka is really big and it includes lots of things that are not likely to change a whole lot, but all of them will change somewhat. I think that it, it has the potential to delete actors because Akka typed an actor is basically an interface with a bunch of methods that return futures, you know, more or less, um, and that's going away. An actor ultimately is just going to be a class and that class might be implemented remotely or locally, but you send messages to actors by calling methods. That's a much more natural paradigm. I don't know if those changes will be made in Akka because sometimes big frameworks, they just continue down their current path because they have existing customers and because there's not a lot of motivation to change things up. So I don't know if these will impact Akka. People will keep using Akka because it's, it's a big, very popular library that solves a lot of real problems. But if they decided to adapt to a post-Loom world, then a lot of things would change. For example, routes in Akka HTTP would not involve futures anymore. Like numerous things would change um, in, in Akka and Akka streams, Akka HTTP, all those libraries would change significantly if you were to adapt them and sort of bring them up to standard with Loom. They don't necessarily have to change. But I think as with all things, like libraries that change with the introduction of Loom will have a longer lifespan than libraries that don't change because for greenfield projects, if you're evaluating one, you want the one that that uses uh, Loom because it's going to be better, easier to use, easier to teach, easier to adopt. It's going to probably have better performance. You don't want the old one that's not adapted. So you want to be looking at this point. You want to be looking for libraries that have a commitment to integrating with Loom because that's the future of everything. Old, old applications that that use anything. Even if they use you know, quasar fibers or something that's probably not going to survive the transition, um, ultimately, if they're used by a big enough company, they'll, they'll live forever. It's just they won't be a, a source of new innovation. Do thread pools still make sense with virtual threads? So well, schedulers make a lot of sense, and schedulers use thread pools. So yes, all these virtual threads, they need to run on physical threads. So they, they need to be carried by one of these physical threads that, that actually does the work. So yes, you still have thread pools, but the thread pools are, are different and it opens up the door to new types of schedulers. The default scheduler for virtual threads will be fork join. Fork join is very good at mixed workloads and that will, that will continue to be used for uh, virtual threads. Um, what if your nice sync async code got run on top of a real thread? How to ensure that it is run on top of a virtual thread? So ultimately, the entry points to many of these things are going to be the libraries that you're using. You probably don't use a new thread dot start right now in your application. I'd be willing to bet you don't use that. More likely than not, you use if you use low-level threads, you use an executor service or maybe use an execution context if you're in Scala. So those things can be backed by virtual threads. And if you're using one of those things, it would be a relatively minor change for you to switch over to virtual threads. But more likely for most of you, you're not even using virtual threads. So you're using, on, you're using um, uh, frameworks or libraries that themselves use execution services executor services and uh, execution contacts and so forth. And so those libraries will probably make the change themselves, honestly. What about volatile is, does it work the same? Yes, it works the same. There's, there's no change in the memory model or, or in the monitor in objects uh, for now. And ultimately any change they make there 
they have to maintain backward compatibility. I would be astounded if they made any change that would impact the correctness of, of applications that are already correct. You might see some changes ultimately that if an application's behavior was undefined, it can now be incorrect. Um, but I, I doubt that if your application is written correctly now, they would ever make any change that would result in it being incorrect. Why do we need old fashioned thread after Loom in code level? Uh, well, it's legacy reasons, honestly, it's legacy. So remember Java has a big history of trying to not break backward compatibility. They've done that unfortunately a few times, but there's so much code that depends that people don't wanna change or even think about. And a lot of code out there, it's creating real threads. It doesn't necessarily expect to be creating virtual threads. So changing that, switching that overnight, you know, you who knows how many problems that would lead to. The more conservative route is to just let it all be the same. It's true that if Java were started from today, hopefully new thread uh, dot start would just be a virtual thread. There would there would be no there would be no concept of a physical thread in the Java language. You know, implementation in the runtime system, there would be real threads, but you would never see that. That would be the ideal way to solve the problem. So you're right. What's what's being created today is not ideal because there still will be real threads and there will be virtual threads and it's up to you or your framework or library to make sure you're using the right type. But but this is the, the compromise that a business has to make if it wants to make sure to retain existing customers and satisfy existing obligations. What do I think the impact will be on streaming libraries like FS2 and Aka Streams? So I think, um, I think it's going to impact the implementations considerably. Uh, but I don't think necessarily the API of Aka Streams or FS2 has to change a whole lot. Uh, so I think you'll probably use it in a similar fashion to the way you use it today. So I, I already answered that question. How can Loom impact projects like Aka Streaming? So I will say this, that um, most likely these solutions will have potential for higher performance um, post Loom. So assuming good integrations with Loom will have a potential for higher performance over time as Loom is optimized. Question, doesn't Zio's internal dispatcher, which is folding Zio at the end of the world affect system performance? Absolutely. So Zio folds over this data structure to evaluate and affect that does have a negative impact on performance. How does Zio keep their code compatible with legacy Java and post Loom Java? So I think, I think the answer is, if you wanna support both at the same time, you need um, different source code. You need, in the old source code, you need to maintain that async node that can make those things go away. But in the new one, you shouldn't have it or you shouldn't use it at least. In a post Loom world, you would at the very least not want to use it. You would want to utilize uh, Loom features for doing the same thing. Is the current future Java future a bundle of communicating synchronizing fibers inside of schedulers? Uh, the current future is just a way to block on a value being completed. Future is the simplest data type in Java, it's not very powerful. At least completable future or completion stage or one of these other types in Java is more powerful and more useful. But they're just simple wrappers that can block or they can chain computations. The implementations can be better in a post-loom world for at least completion stage. But honestly, post-loom, you're never gonna use future again. There will be no reason to use future or no reason to use completion stage or completable future. All that stuff, it goes away. Why, why do that? There's no reason to use those data types anymore in a post-loom world. I talked about performance improvement and what Zio brings as well as what Loom brings to the table. Is there a brand new feature that was not possible before that will be possible now by combining both? And I wanna say probably not. However, Zio will have to emulate less. So because Loom brings more to the table, Zio will have less to emulate, which means simpler implementation and faster performance. Uh, 
and obviously in your own code that's written using Zio, you can call out to Java code and stuff and it won't be blocking anymore. So that's going to make a tangible difference in the day-to-day -day software development if you're a Zio user now. Wouldn't make a sync so implicit that user doesn't even need to know about it lead to more problems than gains, especially while Loom has some places that it will block carrier thread. So I, I've heard that argument. For example, do you expect that when you do a try finally, your finally block is going to call an API asynchronously. You don't expect that, right? And that's that's something that will be possible. You'll call out to an ordinary method that looks synchronous and it will do something behind the scenes that is asynchronous and might take a while or honestly might not ever complete. Um, so yes, that could lead to problems. But in my opinion, this falls in the category of most users don't care. Honestly, what does it matter that we call a routine and it returns synchronously or async? That's an implementation detail. If Java had gotten this right to begin with, we would never know the distinction. We would never know the difference. We would just call things and they would give us back their values. That's the correct way to program. We shouldn't have to know what is a low level implementation detail when we're writing our software. And Loom takes that philosophy. And so yes, this will lead to us you know, putting async code in a finally block. Um, but the reason why that's strange is because we know the difference between sync and async. We know the async stuff tends to be the network-based code or the file file code using NIO. And um, and we know we should we probably shouldn't be doing that inside inside a finally block or even inside other places in our application. Um, but if we didn't know that, it would just be an implementation detail, an irrelevant implementation detail. That's the way it should be, in my opinion. The distinction between them, we're only concerned about that because we've been trained to be concerned about it, because we've been forced to be concerned about it through 15, you know, 20, who knows how many years we've all been doing this on the JVM. But good question. Oh, well, I do think you're right. There's some places that block, that really do block, and some places that don't, and that's going to lead to some surprises. There's no doubt about that. So that's part of why I really hope that a Loom deals with that and eliminates all the blocking to the extent it can, aside from native code, which I understand why you, you can't solve that problem in, in a reasonable fashion. So that's fine. Uh, everything else, I hope, is eventually smoothed over. I hope using synchronized on an object, using that monitor is non-blocking at some point. And that way, you'll be surprised less. Because there's nothing scarier than writing code you think is going to be non-blocking. And because of a few edge cases in code you didn't even write, you called out to some other code, happens to be blocking, and it screws you up. That's a real possibility that we're going to have to deal with. Is there a possibility that working a multi-threaded blocking Java code being run over Loom breaks somehow? No. And, and that's because you opt into virtual threads. So, Zio works on modified in Loom. Um, it just doesn't take advantage of virtual threads. So it, it, the changes that are being made are being made in a very careful fashion to not break code that's already been written. Is there a use case where you would want to block on an operating system thread? Ideally, you would never want to block on an operating system thread um, because you're just you're parking the OS thread and it's not doing anything, why not do something with that resource? Um, so you, in my opinion, there's, there's uh, obviously, if you're interacting with native C code or something like that, then you're sort of constrained to do that. But otherwise, why would you? There's, there's no use case for that. In, in a world where you have full stack async, if the JVM or green threads by default, there's, there's no excuse for that. Question, the fibers are in Zio are implemented purely as a library, but Loom would very likely introduce changes in JVM itself to support virtual threads. Have you had a chance to compare Zio versus Loom for trivial typical, typical cases? So I have not had a chance to do performance benchmarks, but I can guarantee you that uh, Loom will be faster than Zio is emulating this stuff right now. And that's because they made changes to the JVM and I was digging around in the C and C++ code files and taking a look at how it's implemented. And it's fairly straightforward. They have some optimization work to do. But it's very good code. And it's going to be faster than emulating these features at the level of the JVM, for sure, which is why it's important in the future to integrate well with Loom so that when it's released, when it becomes mainstream, we have that really great support in there from day one. 
There were concerns that Loom will not be open enough internals for it to be beneficial to IO Zio task. Is this still the case? Okay, that's a good question. It depends on what you mean by that. So honestly, I never had any concerns with Loom. In my opinion, they're solving this in the correct way. They're solving it in the way they should be solving it. Now, if you were to expose something like continuation to functional programmers, you can imagine they would find a way to use it. And that's a fact. We would find a way to use continuation. So I think, you know, maybe I'm disappointed. Maybe a few other people are disappointed that Java Lang continuation is going to be hidden from us because it's really cool. And it would be nice to be able to use that directly. But that said, there are so many other things that use Java Lang continuation that we can still use from libraries like Zio and indirectly benefit from the features that it has. So, so probably we, we don't, we don't need it. It'd be nice to have, we probably don't need that. And it is certainly true that if they were to have done Loom in a totally different way, that is if they were to have done it in a style that's more compatible with lazy programming of the type practice in the functional effect libraries that we could see more performance increases, that would be true. Um, if, they, if they had decided, oh, we're not gonna do Loom, we're gonna introduce a functional effect system library in Java, that would have been great. That would have been, made us super happy because uh, then we would be have native support of many of the things that we have to emulate. They didn't do that and it's understandable. Why? Because you know that's not where the mainstream market is. But nonetheless, they did enough that it will make a difference in performance and it will simplify internals uh, for the functional effect systems for sure. Question, will Zio Fiber implementation take advantage of Loom? Absolutely. And it's going to simplify the internals a lot. Do you think Loom has enough power to attract devs from other languages? Uh, no, I'm going to be honest. It, it doesn't have enough power to attract developers from other languages. Um, so if you're using Go or you're using Haskell or you're using uh, Kotlin with coroutines, you're not going to see this stuff and be like, oh, my next project has to be in Java. Rather, what will happen is um, when you're struggling or your developers are struggling with all these reactive libraries and stuff that you do now, all the contortions you go through to write really high performance, low latency, high throughput code, um, there won't be a reason to leave Java anymore. There's going to be no reason to leave Java. When we get our startup time down and we solve the green threading problem, why would you leave? There's every library in the world. Everyone knows Java. Everyone and their dog knows Java. And you have other choices as well. You have Kotlin and, and Scala and Clojure. You have lots of great choices. There's no scarcity of choices on the JVM. So what you're going to have is no reasons to leave. And that's, that's a gigantic market. In addition, individual languages give you a reason to adopt. Like you can look at Kotlin and you can say, we want to target Android and, and JavaScript and web and backend from the same language. Done. You can look at Scala and say, wow, the most powerful programming language, functional programming language that has ever achieved this level of mainstream success with amazing metaprogramming capabilities and a credibly, incredibly powerful type system and great libraries that are compositional in nature. That's a reason to use Scala. That's a reason to jump on board. Um, but Loom stuff, it, it doesn't give you a reason to choose Java. It gives you a reason to stick around and not choose something else. That's the way to think about that. Is it worthwhile learning reactive programming style as long as Loom will leverage uh, asynchronicity into the synchronous style of programming? So I think that's up to you. I think if you, if you are using other features of one of these reactive libraries other than asynchronicity, so if you're using concurrency or streams or something like that, then by all means, learn them because there are parts of these libraries that will survive post Loom and thrive. You know, Concurrent streams, they're not going anywhere. Concurrent code, if, if you need concurrency then and you're using these libraries for, for these reasons, then learn them because that part is not going anywhere. It's just gonna be made better in Loom. On the other hand, if you're like, oh, I, I wanna uh, learn how to use future because I don't wanna have to deal with callbacks. Well, you're in luck. Callbacks, their days are numbered. They're going away. And when they go away, you're never going to have to use future ever again if you were using future to avoid callbacks. 
there are a lot there that definitely are a lot of features that Java misses as a programming language, but you, they keep on trying to improve it. And also Java is more than just a language. It's actually a whole platform at this point. What if I want to block an operating system thread when calling thread sleep? Why, why would you want to do that? Um, yeah, why would you want to do that? If you wanted to do that, don't do it on a, don't do it on a virtual thread do it on a real thread, a physical thread. So if you call thread sleep on a, ver if you call like a blocking queue on a physical thread, then it blocks the physical thread. If you call it on a virtual thread, it um, doesn't block. So you can choose which behavior you wanted by which type of thread you have. Now that said, in almost any situation where you think I wanna block, no, you don't wanna block, you want semantic blocking. You don't want to block a physical thread. You just wanna block your code from continuing. Um, virtual threads give you the ability to block the thread from continuing without blocking an operating system level thread. Will Zoom be based, will Zio be based in Loom? Yes. So for the JVM platform, I'm going all in on Loom. Uh, what are Loom developers plans on preemption implementation? Is it possible to have a truly preemptive multitasking? I know that they have some thoughts around that and I, I want to encourage them <laughs> And you should encourage them as well to go right ahead. We need preemption of virtual uh, threads because we can write arbitrary uh, computational code, especially in analytics and data processing. That's just going to suck it up forever. If you give us a virtual thread, we're never going to give it back to you. When we're crunching numbers, we're never going to give you back that thread. So, so designing Loom, I don't not initial release, but you know subsequent revisions, enhancements. Hopefully they will be able to do preemption because you give us this power, we're going to use it and we're going to abuse it. And you can't stop us from doing that unless you have preemption. How much do you think a system based on Akka, Akka cluster will be improved using Loom? I do think it will be improved. I think that, um, I think it will be improved. And I think that's because again, all of the stuff that we emulate, for example, Akka implements a lot of things on Akka actors which are a way of getting async programming and shared changes to a mutable state implemented. So even if you were to implement the actor paradigm using, and that this has been done by the way, using um, Loom, you would still see improvements in performance. So even if you didn't want to change the actor model, now I question how much the actor model makes sense in a post Loom world, but even if you like the actor model and wanted to continue enhancing it, you can do so using Loom. Um, so I would expect, I mean, I would hope that all libraries out there, including Akka and Akka cluster will take advantage of Loom's capabilities for improved performance. In a post Loom world, can you force a library to work on virtual threads without touching the code of that library? The answer is if they expose a hook in there that is responsible for running tasks. So if they accept an execution context or an executor service or something like that, then yeah, you can plug in that. Um, if they don't, then you can't force them. If they have their own thread pool and they do things in their own way, you can't force it. Overall, the upgrades are going to be pretty painless, I think. You're, we're going to have a good experience. How do I compare Go channels and green threading implementation in Loom? Well, uh, there are some things to like about Loom. Basically, Go says, well, we want to force you to communicate using channels. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that's OK but also it's not as natural as communicating using uh, return values, you know, being able to join threads and await their result and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a lot more familiarity in green threads with Loom than there is in Go. Now, neither of them is more powerful than the other and neither of them has the potential to be higher performance. They're, they're roughly equal in, in those respects, but I do think the, paradigms that Java exposes, they're older, they're more familiar. Go introduce Go routine. <laughs> Talk about terminology, Go routine and channels and all this new stuff. Um, and you have to learn that. And if you don't already know it, then that is a learning curve. Whereas you probably don't have to learn the stuff in Java if you've been programming for any length of time. Will Zio performance improve with the use of Loom? Absolutely. I think I answered that before two or three times. I'm gonna quickly go over the remainder of questions. I'm almost done. Do I think we'll, will we change this to Zio's public API because of Loom? Yes, um, yes, for sure. But that's not gonna occur in 1.x. 
honestly, a loom will be 2.x or 3.x. So you shouldn't look for the looms. I mean, we'll probably have loom support in beta or something um, in maybe in the 1.x for sure in the 2.x. But it depends, you know, when does Loom ship? I don't know, honestly, when Loom's going to ship. And also, even when Loom ships, we still have to support pre-Loom because Loom is going to be JDK 16, 17, who knows? Um, so we, we have to support the existing API for some time. So the Loom is going to be opt-in. It's going to be the subset of Zio users who are able to use the latest JDK get new features. And in that new feature version, there's going to be some changes to the API, some simplifications. Some things will be simpler about ZO on Loom, and they'll be faster. And you know, you, there'll be a, a bundle of goodies. There'll be better interop with all the stuff in Loom. Um, there'll be tight integration with uh, scope, scope variables, and with other things. So all that stuff it, it requires a code base that's specific to that, but it has to exist concurrently. So if you're if you're wondering, do do I have to worry about ZO changing radically overnight? The answer is no. The existing API is going to be supported for a long time. Even once Loom is released, we have to continue supporting it because not all people have the option to upgrade to the latest version of the JDK. Colin supports coroutines and futures integration, allowing you to use both in your code base. How do you see similar integration could be achieved on Loom and existing Scala libraries to bridge the two worlds? Um, so a lot of things are gonna become pretty simple, honestly. You can use futures from a Loom code base and you don't have to worry about calling get on futures because it will be non-blocking, assuming the future was running on in an execution context that's leveraging virtual threads, which is fairly easy to do. So there will be integration points. Mostly it will be ignoring the futures and just awaiting on them all the time. And that becoming a non-blocking operation, there'll, there'll be those types of integrations. It's, it's really ironic that the data types that we're trying to save us from the legacy of the JVM's decision to have operating system threads will now themselves become legacy in the new world. Which version of the JVM will Loom be production ready and when? I, I don't know the answers to that question. I know it's, it's obviously not JDK 15. Maybe it could be 16 or 17. Is the fundamental nature of Loom that garbage collection is more predictable or the garbage collection methodology is fundamentally overhauled? No, Loom does not change garbage collection at all. It's going to be unchanged. That said, reactive libraries to emulate the features that Loom provides, they generate a lot of garbage. So once they switch over to use Loom or go away because you don't need them anymore, garbage collection pressure will be reduced for sure. Is the Oh, I already answered that one. How much memory a virtual thread use? Potentially just a few hundred bytes. It doesn't necessarily have to use a lot of memory. How can we calculate how many virtual threads roughly we can support in an application? It depends on how much memory, but you know, if you reserve a few kilobytes, it's gonna depend on several things. There's the overhead of the virtual thread, which they're trying to make small, but then there's the overhead of the um, stack, which has to be saved when a physical thread is not executing that virtual thread. And that's gonna be proportional to the stack size. But um, so that's up to you how deep your stacks are, which is gonna come back to how you end up using virtual threads, what sort of paradigms you embed them in. But I think that it's realistic to, uh, to think that you can have uh, hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of virtual threads. What about the integration of Loom Zia with libraries like Kafka or Spark? Um, so I think a lot of that will come along for the ride in Loom. I think that uh, Zio has good support for Kafka already. Um, and there's some Zio work done to uh, support Spark mainly so you can do a uh, computation parallel locally because Spark handles the distributed part, but there's still lots of things in, that Zio helps you do in parallel locally that, that Spark doesn't try to solve. So there's some integration there. There needs to be more, honestly. Can you give ETA for Loom? Un unfortunately, um, I can't. I would guess that it will be um, in, in, the, in the years. So, so not in a matter of weeks or months, but in years, but maybe not more than a year, maybe, maybe months, you know, high months before we get Loom in a JDK. That's just a guess though, an educated guess. 
And I think that we'll be able to support Loom in Zio, have a, a Loom specific runtime when it launches. Uh, because I'm already very familiar, or at least you know, comparatively familiar with Loom and very familiar with Zio and actively thinking about features that I want to use and how. So probably we'll be able to support that um, maybe even the day the, that it ships, hopefully soon thereafter, if not that day. Talk about the history of error channels and completion channels. And is there any relation to Go? Um, you mean in, I, I think that question requires clarification. I'm not sure if that's completion stages or, or something else. And I think I need more context to answer that question. How will Loom improve Zio streams? Oh yeah, so streaming libraries universally, streaming libraries are async and they, they have to be async in a very special way of supporting callbacks. So because that code can be deleted and simplified and can be made like ordinary async code, it means that things will get faster. So you won't need any API changes. Streams are already high level. They work at a high level. You filter streams, you map them, you merge them together. You do all these things that you want to keep on doing even post Loom. Streams is going to change the least of anything. The only thing that's going to change about streams really is um, they'll become faster and their implementations will become simpler. But you're still going to need streams. Streaming library is important to any modern application, even if you write one in Java. What percentage of speed bump Zio based apps could have when using Loom? I don't have any great idea, but I would ballpark it, you know, probably 10 to 20, 20 to 30% would be my guess. Uh, how do I think memory usage will change if you have millions of green threads all flat mapping and creating new objects in Scala? Well, you already have that, <laughs> probably. Uh, if you're using millions of fibers right now, um, there's a lot of heap churn. And I'm glad this is affecting Java too now. It's, a, it's affecting Java because of lambdas. It's increasing heap churn in Java applications because that leads to pressure to improve performance of, of garbage collection on uh, short-lived objects, which is what Scala generates a lot of. So I, I don't think that there's going to be, there's going to be, uh, actually that question disappeared. Oh no, here it is. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think that uh, functional effect systems have to watch out for being in a world where we get async for free we have to watch out that we're not doing creating too much heap churn because that could potentially be the bottleneck. Now you get a few other things from a functional effect system like you get global program efficiency, things that are not needed or terminated. Um, and so it remains to be seen ultimately how that will balance out the less heap churn that you'll have in an application not written using functional effects. But we, we have to watch out, we have to be very diligent to implement uh, these runtime systems and our APIs in a manner that minimizes heap churn. That's going to become more important in a post-Loom world. What's the situation with Loom and Graal VM? I, I don't know. I, I did see some code in there at the intersection of the two. So maybe it works for all I know. I actually didn't try that. What's the difference between Zio and uh, Loom interruptibility? Okay, so Interruptibility doesn't change yet for the Loom fibers. You still use thread interrupt. So one thread interrupts another, it throws an interrupted exception. Zeo already integrates with that mechanism, but that's a horrible mechanism for interruption. And the authors of Loom know that. They know it's especially bad for virtual threads. So they're hopefully gonna improve that. Anyway, any improvement that they make to the interruption model can be tied into Zoom, to Zeo, Zeo's interruption. So Zeo already integrates between the two but that integration could improve depending on what Loom does. Is Loom coming to all or most of the main JV implementations, or just the open JDK? I don't know the answer to the question. I, I think Loom is, is fundamental and everyone needs to support it if they, if they wanna stay relevant. It's just, we need this badly. Okay, two more questions. <laughs> For those of you who've managed to survive, uh, just two more questions. And then I'll let you go. It's the free t-shirts. Wow. We're going to have to use that more often. Or maybe we shouldn't use free t-shirts because this is almost too many questions. I'm pretty sure that with Loom, many Java devs will say, 
uh, why learn Scala or, or Kotlin? I can have it all in Java. How to convince them that FP still has advantages? Um, good question. Show them a library like Caliban. S show them a library uh, like FS2 or Zio Streams. Show them a library like Zio Config or like some of the other libraries in development. Show them a library like Tapir where you define an endpoint and suddenly you can get um, client documentation and client libraries and a server and all of that stuff for free. Show them these libraries that solve business pains that leverage features of the Scala programming language that don't exist in Java. You can't do that in, in Java. In, in fact, like uh, I would even be willing to say we should, we should have like a, a competition here, write a GraphQL API in Scala, write one in, in Java, We'll see who wins first and what features the end product has, or even like, you know, tap ear and endpoints. Let's have these type of competitions, make them fun, you know, just fun and light, light natured. But honestly, the reason to use Scala is the language is powerful and you can build, and some people have built libraries in this language that are very powerful. And they make you as an indiv individual developer, very productive. You know in advance if your code's gonna work. This Scala type system is very good. You can know in advance if it's gonna work by looking at and making sure it types checks to, to some degree, not all the way, but to a, a large degree. A lot of people have that experience and you can get so much functionality for free because of features like Scala can write code for you. A term inference, other features like that, metaprogramming capabilities go off the chart in Scala 3. So you should use Scala if you want to be a programmer um, who is very productive, who works at a high level of abstraction with strong help from the Scala compiler. That's the reason to use Scala. It's not async or anything like that. You should use it because um, it's a powerful language whose powerful libraries help you be amazingly productive. Now, that's not to say Java is a weak language. There are different languages. They have different feature sets, but a lot of people who who switch over to Scala, they, they're, they find that they're more productive and they're able to catch more bugs at compile time. And honestly, it's it's the libraries, it's the cool things you can do in Scala that will attract other people. And and maybe async is no longer a cool thing or won't be a cool, cool thing after Loom, but async is not a game changer for Scala. Honestly, the game changers are all in other areas like compositional concurrency and compositionality is the big story of Scala. Compositionality and free stuff that you get from that is the big story of why you should be using Scala. Okay, question, do I think Loom will affect Kotlin coroutines? I think it better. I think it has to. I think because Kotlin made the choice of incorporating language features to deal with this problem. So Kotlin, the language designers, they knew. They knew Java has this big albatross around its neck that's dragging it down. And they got out there in front of the curve and they solved this problem in, in a pretty good way. And now they have to deal with the reality that Java itself is, is changing. It's absorbing some of that goodness and baking it into the JVM. And, and honestly, they have to do it in a way that's, that's uh, seamless. And that also takes into consideration that they have to support the Android and JavaScript platforms. So they will, they will affect Kotlin. Um, it remains to be seen exactly how they have to affect Kotlin because Kotlin can't ignore Loom. Loom, Loom is significant. It's gonna change the whole ecosystem. All right, finally, after all of those questions, we have reached the very end and there were so many great questions. It's really hard to pick one. Honestly, just so many amazing questions. I, I don't know how to pick one. <laughs> you should pick one. <laughs> Maybe we can pick more than one. <laughs> like three. Maybe we, maybe we can. Maybe we should. We should yeah. copy all these. Is there a way to copy them and pick them? That way we can uh, just send email. Yeah, just a second. We'll we'll pick a we'll pick a few winners. Uh -huh. These were all really great questions. I appreciate everyone mm -hmm. taking their time to ask such uh, detailed and insightful questions. Uh, that that uh, in in some cases, you know, they have tricky answers or, and, and also subjective answers. I think, you know, not everyone will give you the same answer to these, to these questions that I will. All right, so we'll, we'll try to copy these. Yeah, I got it. You did, okay. And then we'll pick a few. Yeah. 
a few winners. So you can expect a free ticket to Functional Scala 2020. Thank you all for coming to this meetup and putting up with me for two and a half hours, especially those of you who just got done with putting up with me for three days in a row. I appreciate uh, you being here. I appreciate the great questions. And I encourage you to go immediately to Evolution Gaming and apply for one of these amazing jobs. And if you do, I might get a chance to, to see you uh, later next year. Thank you all.